It's good to be here with you guys. Uh, have, have you ever been in, in a spot where you're sitting down to pray and uh, maybe you got, you got your cup of coffee ready and uh, you're like, all right, I'm going to get some focus time in right now. It's going to be me and Jesus time. And you start praying. You're like, oh, Lord, thank you for this blessing in my life. Thank you for providing this. And um, God, would you, would you help me with this? God, that person at work just continues to drive me crazy. Lord, help me not to slap them in the face. Like, God, I just, I don't want to go back and talk to HR again. Like, I've been through this before. Um, and uh, and as, you, as you continue to pray for what you're thankful for, or what you're longing for, then um, soon the prayer turns to, like, and I think we are out of Pop-Tarts. <laughs> and, oh my gosh, we don't even have Doritos. How are we going to have a cookout tonight? Like, what's the point of even doing this? And uh, before you know it, what you sat down to do was spend time with God, and what you really came up with was a grocery list that you needed to complete. Has anybody else been in a situation like that before? <laughs> Thank you for not leaving a brother hanging up here, <laughs> uh, feeling like I'm the only one uh, in that spot. And I think there's, there's a lot of things when it comes to prayer where we can feel really inadequate. Sometimes it can feel like, man, I struggle just to listen to God at all. Like it feels like all I'm hearing is my own voice. Or um, sometimes it feels like I can't focus. Sometimes it feels like, man, I just don't even talk to God enough. And then we start to even just feel guilty, like ashamed. Like I feel like I should want to do this, but like I've got all these things to do. And so we get off track. There's a lot of struggles we can have with prayer, and that's why this morning we're going to have a conversation titled, Why Am I So Bad at Prayer? And I think they selected me to talk about this because, uh, <laughs> uh, well, I've already shared that. <laughs> but uh, I, I honestly think there is, is a lot of places for us that we can feel really inadequate. And my hope for today, as we're uh, doing a series of talks called uh, Out of the Shallows, is that we would step out of the shallow end of our faith and into something so much deeper and so much richer with the Lord. I hope and pray that for you. So would you pray with me? God, I, I thank you for this morning and for this opportunity to be able to connect with you. I thank you that you are already here in this place, and I pray that you would speak to us, Lord, this morning. We are listening. Amen. So today we're going to look at a text from Romans chapter 8, and uh, this, this text has been called, uh, the book of Romans actually has been called by one of my favorite theologians as the most important book in all of scripture for what it provides for us as uh, followers of Jesus. And, um, and that same theologian says that Romans 8 is actually kind of the climax, the pinnacle of the book of Romans. And so uh, it's a rich, rich book with a, uh, and a rich chapter that we're going to be looking at. We'll be doing it this week. And again, um, Pastor Bob will be with us here next week, breaking down another portion of it. Uh, but I think it's got some really helpful things for us today. Here's what Paul writes to the church in Rome. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. But hope that is, not, hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what they already have? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. So, why are we so bad at prayer? Well, the first reason is that we think that prayer should be easy, and we're wrong. <laughs> you know, it, you, when, when you look at this passage that we just read, you hear all of these words used. Groaning is used twice. Waiting eagerly. Or the pains of childbirth. I've, uh, I've never had a child myself um, and, and have no plans or intentions to. That came out weird. Um, 
<laughs> but I have been in the room where a, a child was born two times. And man, I can tell you it was painful and uh, it, it looked unbelievably difficult for what my wife went through. And uh, I can tell you that sometimes for us in our prayer life, we think it should just be this really easy connection, but sometimes it can be really, really challenging. And the thing about prayer is prayer takes real work and real intentionality from us. You know, our, our natural tendency as we go about our days and go about our lives, I think, is that we want to rely on our own intelligence, our own problem-solving skills. Um, but do we really think that at the end of every day, we individually know the very best way to solve all of the problems around us? Do you recognize what an arrogant thought that is? But the truth is, is we would never say that, but then the way our lives lead out, it plays out that way. And I think this is what can happen for us when we don't talk to God regularly, is that we can fall into this trap. Dr. Timothy Keller says it this way. He says, to fail to pray then is not merely to break some religious rule. It is a failure to treat God as God. And the great temptation for you and for me is to become the gods of our own lives, to do what I think is best for me and for mine, to pursue what I want, when I want it. And the truth is, is that's, that's what a toddler wants. When a toddler doesn't get what they want, they, they throw their fit, right? God has something so much more mature and beautiful for us as we grow and as we progress in our faith. And my deep concern is, is not that we wouldn't use our brains and our, our gifts that God has given to serve other people, but my concern is that we will fall more in love with the gifts from God rather than the gift giver. And you know what God is ultimately after? He's ultimately after a relationship with you. One filled with trust, one filled with hope. That is what God wants from us. And we've got to recognize that our relationship with God, in some ways, it's, it's like in, in a marriage where, uh, you know, it's, it's not always perfect and easy and communication just flows perfectly all the time. At least that's not how it works for our marriage uh, here. But God wants us to recognize that even though sometimes prayer can be hard and connection can be difficult, prayer is valuable for what it can provide into our hearts and into our lives. The second reason we are bad at prayer is we think we should sound better when we pray. I, I don't know about you, but there are times where I pray. Actually, this happened just recently. I was praying with my wife and I feel like I sounded like a babbling buffoon. <laughs> And I was like, man, this did not sound good at all. <laughs> and one thing that gives me hope is that in this passage we look at is it says the Holy Spirit can actually interpret our hearts, like even our wordless groans that we can say and share to God. He can take that and align it with the will of God that he's in such close relationship with God the Father that he can understand on our behalf. And that's one of those like heavenly mysteries I don't fully comprehend or understand, but I'm grateful that we have a God that can understand even our own hearts as we try to express it poorly in front of others. But I, I think uh, the other thing that is true is when we look at uh, Luke chapter 18, there's this passage, this parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector. And the Pharisees were people, where they were the religious leaders of the day, and, and they were like held in high esteem um, for, for their role and for their position, their connection to God. And then there were the tax collectors, who were the people that everybody despised more than everybody else. Like, they were, they were no taxation without representation. Alexander Hamilton would have had a fit on these dudes at that time. He might have broken out in a song even. I don't know. <laughs> um, but what, what, I can, what I can tell you is that Jesus tells this story and he totally flips everything that everybody was expecting upside down because everybody thinks like, oh, well, the religious leaders, they're impressive. But he talks about how these, these Pharisees were the ones who would try to boast about what an impressive person they were. 
I give all this money to the poor and I help all of these people and I, you know, and they're bragging. And then the tax collector simply says like, God, I just, I need you more than anything else in my life. And Jesus says, it's actually the tax collector that is the one who comes to God with a humble heart that will stand before God justified one day, not the other way around. And see, we still get this twisted here today. We think that it's the religious elite that are the ones who are like always the most impressive, who use the, the, the greatest language from exactly from the Bible. And, you know, there's power in praying scripture to be certain. But God is not after our Christianese and us trying to show what a good person or Christian we are. Ultimately, what God is after is a humble heart that's willing to say, God, I don't know all the answers. I don't understand it all. And that's why, God, I really, really need you. And if you've ever felt like, I just don't sound so good when I pray, just know that's not the thing that God wants from you anyway. He wants your humble heart. The third reason why we are bad at prayer actually comes to us twice in this passage that we looked at. First, in verse 25, it says, it reminds us that even as we hope, we wait for it patiently. Or in verse number 23, it says, we wait eagerly. Why are we bad at prayer? Because we hate waiting. I'm an American. <laughs> I ain't waiting for nothing. Give me that fast food right now. Like it needs to be ready on my table. You know, like this is how we are. Like even for me, if I pull up to a stoplight and it's one of those ones with the sensors and somebody else has the green light and I'm sitting there at the red and it's like, it's not triggering it. So I'm like sitting there for a couple extra seconds. I'm like rolling my car forward and backward, like trying to make sure it hits that sensor because I don't want to wait an extra eight seconds in my day. We hate <laughs> waiting. Why? Because waiting is hard. I don't want to wait for anything. But the thing of it is, when it comes to our spiritual lives, waiting is not just sitting around, just like sitting on our hands and not doing anything. Waiting is not passive. We wait eagerly. Eagerly. There's, there's an action actually attached to it. And we must remember that prayer is not a passive activity. It's a moving of heaven. Like that's what's happening as you are praying. It's incredible. And here's the thing is that sometimes the way it works for us is that as we talk to God, we, we have him leading us to do something. And sometimes God is leading us simply to be still and to wait. And Here's the thing. Sometimes for us, and maybe you're prone, maybe one more one way or the other. Maybe for you, it's like, you know what? Like, <clears throat> there's so much wrong in this world. Like, we need to get in the game. We need to do this. We need to get active. We need to, and to be sure, there is a time and a place for that. And then sometimes we could fall into the temptation of like, man, this world is so broken and so messed up. Like, who am I? I'm never going to make a difference. Like, I'll just wait on God. And so we end up actually disengaging. We call it waiting, but really it's apathy. And the only way we can really discern the difference of whether we're supposed to get into the game or whether we're to sit and be still with the Lord is to talk to him and to ask him. Because not all of us are called to the exact same things at the exact same times. And so... For you to know whether you to be still or to be active, God is inviting us today to talk to him. You know, even Jesus was actually criticized because uh, he, he withdrew from the crowds. He, he would heal the lame and he would help the blind to see. But you know what Jesus did on many, many occasions is he went to be still, to be with God the Father to spend time with him before he even launches into any sort of public ministry. That's where he spends his time. That's his rock. That's his cornerstone is spending time in prayer. If Jesus needed it as the son of man, how much more do we need it in our hearts, in our lives?
The fourth and final reason that we are bad at prayer is we lack hope that our prayers are actually going to make a difference. And this one, I think, is, is big for us. Uh, this, is, this is what Paul writes. He says, For in this hope we were saved, but hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what they already have? For if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. You see, sometimes I think for us, we lack hope because we feel like we can't see a tangible God. Like Jesus isn't standing right here, like physically. So for us, we think like, man, if I could just like see and touch Jesus, I would just like believe so much better and my faith would be on fire and like I would follow after all the things God has for me. But I think sometimes we start to think these things and we've got to play these thoughts all the way out to see how true they are. And the first thing I would say to that is, number one, you had the disciples and many others who walked around with Jesus, literally, physically, God, 100% God, 100% man in the flesh. And they walked around and they saw him. They, and he, God tried to say, I'm the Messiah. I'm going to die. I'm going to rise again. He tried to lay out the whole plan. And poor Thomas, the dude is literally just called like doubting Thomas now for the rest of time, like this poor dude. Um, but but for, for Thomas, he, he, he sees the resurrected Jesus and he's like, mm, I'm not so sure. Like, is this just like the twin of Jesus that we never met before? Like, I'm going to need a little proof here. And so Jesus turns over his hands and his wrists and shows the actual scars. And so if even the disciples who walked and saw Jesus do all of the miracles doubted, would we really be so different? I'm not so sure. But not only that, if, if we had the literal physical Jesus standing right here, which he said, by the way, it's actually better that I would go, that I'll give you the Holy Spirit, that you can access me at all times, anywhere, anytime. But if he were standing right here, Paul's point is that it wouldn't actually require any hope or any faith at all for us. Because now look, we're looking right at Jesus. It doesn't require that anymore. And, and I think he makes a potent point about what is God ultimately after. He is after the hope of our heart. He is after the trust that we would place into him. And we got to recognize Jesus is the promise. Jesus is the reward. All the other promises of this world that can come to be or not come to be, like they pale in comparison and they end up falling short. This is why when you hear um, celebrities or um, athletes, professional athletes, that the people who have it all in the world standards, when you hear them talk about a, a life that, that doesn't have Jesus included in it, they say like, you know what? I have it all, but something still feels empty. I'm still longing and craving for something inside. And it's not just the uber wealthy that that is true for. That's true for you and for me. When we lack hope, we stop praying. And the truth is, is that God actually wants to have a relationship with you and for me. And God has given us amazing truths in scriptures and amazing promises. And actually, a couple of them actually pop up in this text that we were looking at today. Verse 26 says this, in the same way, the spirit helps us in our weakness. And this is one of the things that I find uh, that I'm most grateful about the character of the Holy Spirit is that the spirit will always help us in our weakness. And so I want to do a quick self-assessment time for you to look inward at your own heart right now and think, where is the spot where you feel most weak right now? Where are you most vulnerable? Where are the places that you are struggling? Maybe the, the thing that keeps you up at night as your head uh, swirls. One of the things that um, I felt weak in is um, I've been facing fatigue ever since I uh, had COVID back in January, it wiped me out for a few days. And ever since then, I've just needed to like so much sleep. And honestly, it's like, it's very, very frustrating to me. I have to go to bed early, which means I can't stay up and watch the game that I wanted to watch. And then I have to sleep in late, which means I can't get up early and get the things done I want to get done. And so I get 
irritated at this. And I'm like, it's been six months, like, come on. And you know, even as I was reading this passage this week, it dawned on me, I've got an option. I've got a crossroads anytime I'm facing any level of irritation, whether small or big. Like I can choose to whine about it and Lord knows my, my wife has heard it. <laughs> um, or I can choose to bring that to God, to meet with the spirit who wants to meet me in my weakness. Because maybe God wants to teach me something even through this small trial in my life. Like maybe he's trying to say, hey, Jonathan, guess what? Uh, you just getting things done is not ultimately what brings you value in your life. Or maybe he's trying to tell me, you know what? It's time to slow down a little bit. It's time to rest and be still a little bit. Or maybe God's trying to tell me, hey, guess what? I want to do something amazing and a miracle in your life and heal your physical body on this side of heaven. And, I, and honestly, I don't, I don't know what God is doing, but I can tell you this. If I don't take the time to talk to him and to listen to him, I'm going to completely miss it altogether. And how often does this happen for you and for me, even with something as small as an irritation of missing some sleep? And so for today, if you feel like, I just don't know really what to talk to God about sometimes, I would encourage you to start in the places where you feel weak. Because the promise of scripture is that he will meet us in our weakness. The, the final promise that I want for us to look at today um, comes at the end of the passage of the verses that we were looking at in verse 28. It's a popular passage, a popular verse that says, and we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. And I'll tell you this, it's important for us to recognize that this verse does not mean that nothing bad is ever going to happen to you if you put your trust and your faith in Jesus. Like that, that's not what this text is saying. But what it is saying is it's reminding us that one day God is going to redeem all things, all things. So those inequities that you face in your life because of your skin color or your gender or any other way that our culture has found to divide us. And one day God is coming back and he's going to make that right again. Or those tears that you cry for the loved one that you lost, one day God is coming back and he's going to wipe every tear from our eye. And for that physical pain that you continue to navigate each and every day, one day God is coming back and he's going to restore all things. And we, we must recognize this promise that Jesus is working on our behalf. Jesus is coming back to make all things right again. But when we don't talk to God, we totally forget these promises. Like this is what actually I think happens. It's not just that like we, we start to miss out on a connection to the divine, which is miraculous in and of itself. But I think that what happens is we drift away from the promises that God has actually said is true about you and me. So instead of believing that God has said you are enough because you are a child of God, instead, what, what we start to do is we start to look in the mirror and we see all the things that we wish were different about us. Or when we're facing our own weakness, we drift away from the promise that he is our strength. Strength will rise as we lean on him. And what happens in our lives is we begin to try to make things happen on our own. Or if we forget that God is coming back to redeem all things, what we do is we get sucked up into all the headlines and all the darkness that is in this world. And friends, I know that this world is so ridiculously dark right now. I see it and I feel it and I grieve it. But when we forget that God is coming back, we start to fill in the blank that God doesn't care. All of these things, we start to drift away from God just because we haven't taken the time to be with him, to listen to him, to hear his voice. 
And what I know about God is that he actually desires your heart to be in relationship with you. Like that's why he came back for the cross is out of love and motivation for you and for your heart. So this morning, I want to give you another chance to be able to meet with God. So would you actually just bow your heads and close your eyes? And what, what I want you to know is that this is a chance for you to be able to bring your weakness before him. Maybe it's a relational strain or a sickness. Maybe it's even just your relationship with God that's struggling. You can be very open and honest with him about that. But whatever you are struggling with, know right now that the Holy Spirit wants to meet with you. He even pleads to God the Father on our behalf. And it's incredibly amazing what is possible when you talk to God. So I'm going to give you a minute of silence to be able to do just that. So God, we make room for you to help us in our weakness. We know that when we are weak, you are strong. And so this morning, we exalt your name to turn our eyes heavenward. God, whether we get the, the answer to prayer, we are wanting and desiring. God, would you help each of us to be people who lean on you and who trust on you? We don't just view you as some kind of vending machine that we just put in some coins and we get exactly what we want, but instead to be a people that fully trust you, regardless of what it is that we face. In Jesus' name, amen. Church, would you stand? Let's continue to meet with the Lord today.